Welcome to the Stonehenge View, a podcast series which interviews a range of sport club representatives and leading professional sport club personnel during the COVID-19 shutdown period. We find out what these clubs are doing during the current health crisis and also some of the sports people with some of our most popular sports seasons postponed. I'm Mark Heenan and today I'm joined by my co-host Mark Stone. Welcome Stoney. It's great to have you on and because you're sponsoring your business in media advice advisory services is sponsoring this person but also sponsoring episode 28 of the Stonehenge View podcast so thank you. Yeah thanks Mark and you know when you meet the good guys in sport our next guest is one of those good guys. I've only met him once but it's like uh, I've known him for a long time so uh, it was many years ago but uh, looking forward to the conversation. And I've met him too and I've been impressed with his leadership skills at a local level as well. Today's guest works as a director of AFL draft and strategy with Capital Sport and is one of the few accredited AFL player agents to have experienced the demands of professional football while furthering his education with his Bachelor of Business in Sports Management and Marketing. He played six AFL games with Adelaide and Melbourne between 2005 and 2010 after being eighth selection in the 2004 AFL National Draft. He rejoined his local junior football club, Mottawari, in 2018 as senior co-coach along with Josh Finch, which play in the Ballerine Football League and guided the Warriors to its first BFL Senior Premiership in 2018. Last year, he was the joint winner of the Les Ash Medal alongside Torquay's Dom Gleeson, which is the biggest individual accolade in the BFL. Next season, he'll take on a senior assistant coaching role at Collegians in the Victorian Amateur Football Association. We welcome to the Stonehenge View podcast, AFL accredited player agent, John Meeson. Welcome, John. Hey, John, just a quick one. We've had a bit of a theme of Les Ash uh, medalists in the last couple of weeks we've had Dom Gleeson on and we had the son-in-law of Les Ash on last week. Oh there you go well thanks for having me fellas it's a uh, fairly detailed introduction there but I still remember meeting both of you for the first time so Stoney I, I, it was at a, a cafe I think I had to shout you the coffee you didn't bring you your did. wallet and, <laughs> and uh, Heaney yeah it was after a, a game down at Ocean Grove so it's uh, yeah it's good to be here. Yeah I, I remember that I think you're about to have a beer at, after a win at Ocean Grove so uh, thanks for having a chat that time and um, I really got to learn about your sort of leadership not just your playing ability as well we know what time of the year we're in I mean obviously the AFL season is a little bit later this year in terms of sort of the you know when the grand final is and you know we're, we're coming up to the prelim finals this weekend and there's four teams left we are going through COVID this is what the podcast is about how sports people are affected by COVID but you yourself are, are working from home you're based up I believe in Port Melbourne you've probably got family down here in Geelong but you've also got a wife and a young bub how does a player agent work in COVID around trying to negotiate players contracts for future seasons when they're up in a hub in Queensland? Yeah it's certainly been difficult this year I think the lucky part of what we do is that essentially we don't need a lot of face-to-face -face time with players throughout the season and with the players in the hub with the condensed fixture going on it's obviously something that they're very focused on what they're doing you know week to week and, and in some circumstances they're playing three or four games in, in two or three weeks. For us as, as agents the most important relationship that we need to have after the one with the player is list managers of football clubs and the decision makers of footy clubs. Thankfully, most of them are based in Melbourne. So other than Darren Glass in at, uh, at West Coast, pretty much, well, every single other list manager lives um, and works out of Melbourne. Dom Ambrugio, the, the list manager of the Brisbane Lions, lives across the road from me in Port Melbourne. David Walls from Fremantle lives in Melbourne as well. So for us, the most important relationship other than the player is with the list manager. So we're lucky that, that, you know, those conversations with those decision makers at football clubs were able to continue to, to happen and we can work from anywhere really. John, I was really conscious about the question I was going to ask you about as far as a day in the life of a player manager and also about how much now it's changed since you were playing and the parents, how much, you know, what the players are after. So I suppose what's a day in the life of a, a manager, but also what are the players looking for these days to, you know, because it's a pretty competitive marketplace. So you want to try and give the best service you can at Capital. So what is, well, how does that work? Yeah, how does it play out? Yeah, so myself and Marty Pask, who's another ex-player who's um, played down at Werribee, um, you'd know very well, Stoney, yeah. but uh, we, we had I-50 management. We're both ex-players and, and we probably come with a view of we knew what we wanted as players when we went through the process. Both moved into state. We both had injuries along the way, got dropped, missed out, got homesick. We felt all the emotions that players are likely to feel. And a lot of the time, having that empathy for players can, can help you relate and, and see um, troublesome times or you know be able to capitalise on, 
on opportunities in the marketplace as well. But um, we recently joined up with Peter Lenton, who's been an agent for 20 odd years. Very, very good with the finance and whatnot. Obviously, as you said, it's a competitive landscape. So for us, you know, we've done it as players. So we, we've got that ability to relate to the players. But then Pete comes in as well, who's, you know, a, a guru in the finance space. And he's able to set our players up enormously well off the field as well to make sure that, hey, if you're only in it for a couple of years or you're in it for 10 or 15 years, you know, that you're going to get looked after and you're going to be able to hopefully set yourself up for life after footy. But in terms of the day-to-day, you're right, it is very competitive. There's no, you know, come in to work today and you've got your work set out for you. A lot of the time, it's got to prioritise what you need to do. The more players you get, obviously, the more you have to juggle your time. But, you know, we, we start scouting players at 15, 16 years old. So, you know, we, we do a lot of work early days for the draft. So a lot of people think, you know, a player comes in, gets drafted, and then they get a manager. A lot of the time now, um, and this is what's changed from when I went through it, is some of these players are getting managers at, at 15, 16 years old. It's the first big decision that they've made. And a lot of the time, you know, they're impressionable and they rush into decisions. And, and we try and talk to the parents around, okay, well, this is what we do. Go out and talk to some other agents as well and find out what they do and how we differ. And most of the time, you get good fits. Like we, we're pretty fortunate. We haven't had any players sack us, but we've had, you know, six or seven players cross over from other managers and, and join with us. So I guess that tells us that we're doing a good job, but, you know, we're, we're pretty well resourced in here and we don't take on more than we can handle. So I think as we continue to grow and get bigger, you know, like we'll mix with the big boys as such, but um, but at the moment, it's, you know, it's a, it's a pretty good little lifestyle. John, uh, just a couple of things here. Um, I guess in some ways, you've got players at different stages of their development, whether they're players that are tired or they're about to retire, whether they're young players making their way into the AFL, players that are sort of the mid part of their career. I guess in some ways, what does make a good AFL player manager and how important, I mean, sometimes on the outside, we think, you know, you're doing the contracts and you're doing all the stuff with the player and you're negotiating with the clubs. But there's a lot that goes into it. I mean, take, for example, one of your players, Kate Simpson, that's retired. You're obviously assisting them with their career post AFL. Yeah, so a lot of what we do now is exactly that. It's it's trying to help the players capitalise on opportunities while they're in it, but also have some sense of reality that this isn't going to end forever. You know, in normal circumstances, a person will, you know, go to university or do a trade and, and their salary will progressively keep going up throughout their career. With an AFL player, they earn a lot of money very, very early on in their career. So being able to help players and guide them, and at the end of the day, we give them guidance, they will do what they want to do, whether that be trade or, or financial activities. But for us, it's trying to it's trying to give them some perspective and, and understand that the talent will always be on, it'll turn off at some point and making sure that you know the players have something that they can go to for life after football, whenever that might be. Cade Simpson, we thought he was going to retire every year for the last five years, but he's he hanging on and, and going really well. And then, you know, a player like a James Warple, for example, gets gets drafted and his second year wins at best and fairer. So you now we've, we've got guys at different levels of the spectrum, but that's the most rewarding for us is, is being on the journey with the players. And, and money will come and go, but just seeing the players and you know, play their first or get drafted, play their first games, play milestone games, and you know, then have a family, buy a house, you know, do all these little things is, I guess, what makes it worthwhile. John, is seeing a player really achieve their goals and, and follow the guidelines and maximise their effort, is that is that the biggest um, reward for you as in your role? Yeah, I, th- I think so. I think as well, having been a player, I, I got drafted, as Mark said before, I got drafted, you know, the eighth pick in, in the draft. And Buddy Franklin, I think, was picked five, you know, and, and there was Jordan Lewis, Jared Ruffhead, Brett Deledio, all these guys that went on and had unbelievable careers. And I'm seen as a failure. But, you know, like, I don't think players should be defined by their ability to kick a football. And it's certainly something that we give perspective to um, our players. And money's the same. We didn't have the careers we wanted, but everything that we went through as players hold us and do hold, um, held us in good stead for what we do now to give that empathy and, and whatnot. And look, you know, players have, a, you know, they, they're not immune from, you know, feelings and, and, you know, and a lot of people think they'll come in and be like Joel Selwood and have a career and, you know, walk away with three or four houses and beautiful marriage and, you know, all these accolades. For 99% of players, that isn't the reality. It's a tough, hard slog. It's, you know, base wages, it's getting dropped, it's missing out, it's getting delisted, it's one year contracts, you know, basically on the last day of, of contracting. And the unknown is a lot of it and, and football is a business at the end of the day. And, and I think that's why we always try and do what's best for the player in every circumstance. Now, that's not necessarily always taking the most money either. You know, for example, I'm looking after Adam Saad and he's um, a topical player at the moment, you know, and, and for him, it's not about money for me. My job, once he makes a decision to, to want to leave a football club, is to maximise his value and provide him with options. As I said before, the players will do what's best for them. But I think if, if they go through it 
you know, and they, they're doing things for the right reasons, they'll always get a good outcome at the end of the day. John, I was actually going to declare I'm actually an Essendon supporter as well. So I noticed you got, <laughs> I am. I don't know if there's any Sorry, Essendon really are in front of me or behind me. Well, there is in front of me, Matthew Lloyd, Memento. <laughs> but <laughs> I guess in some ways, not only have you got Saad, but uh, you've got Dyson Heppel as well. So there's a connection there with the Bombers. And, and then, you know, you have got younger players on the list, you know. Obviously, you know, well, someone that's been around for a while, you've got Ryan Burns and you've got Jack Payne and you've got Caleb Daniel or Caleb Dan- Daniels is an established player at AFL ranks with the Bulldogs. Take me into the situation. I mean, look, I understand it's a bit hard to sort of talk about Saad because it's, it is a topical issue, but how's he going? Obviously, the postseason, without being in the hub, what emotion do you feel or do you get, what understanding do you get on a player like Saad coming out of a hub and then wanting to seek a trade? Yeah, so it, it was, it's difficult because you've got to try and keep it in perspective that everything's elevated when you're in the hub because you've got no outlet. Adam, being a very spiritual guy, he's a practicing Muslim like, like Basha Huli. He gets up at 4am and, and prays four or five times a day and, and that's his outlet. And football is so far down the pecking order for him. It's family and his religion are one and two and happiness. And I think what, what we did with Adam was to let him get home, let him gather his thoughts, try and give him some perspective on, you know, things are heightened in the hub and everyone's crawling over each other and go and get your thoughts. But you know, we were very, very transparent with Essendon the whole way along that um, he was struggling with a certain, a couple of certain things and he had some issues and concerns with some some certain things going on at the football club, as did Dyson Heppel. It's not just an isolated Adam thing. Adam, at the end of the day, gets home and we have a few conversations and, and then when he tells me, he thinks that the best thing to do is go separate ways. You talk him through all the options around, okay, what are the positives, the negatives? It's something that I kept coming back to and, and he kept coming back to. It was He felt like if he had have stayed, he would have been staying just for the friends and, and for the relationships he had in the football club, but he wouldn't have been able to give 100% and be genuinely happy. So for him, he decided to change um, what he could control. And and I think that's all you can do. You can you can talk him through it. I think it got to a point where Essendon could have offered him a million dollars a year and, and he felt like the best thing for him to do was separate ways. So they're making decisions based on what's best for them and, and not, you know, things like money, then it's certainly, I'm very comfortable that he went through a, a process. He took the emotion out of it and he came up with his decision. And as his agent, I then go and speak to the market and get him the best deal possible. And, and within that, you know, there's certain factors that made Carlton very attractive to him. And yeah, he's he's very happy with his decision. And it's obviously a down part of the job is, is having that discussion with Essen because there's some emotion attached. But I mean, like me or like you guys, people change jobs every day and people do things for what's best for them. But with football, there's all this emotion and, and it's tribal and there's loyalty and, you know, you can't do this and you can't do that. But at the end of the day, he felt like, you know, the best thing for him to do was to cut ties and, and move on. And, and like I said, it's in common practice, it's it's fine to be able to do that. But with football, we, we kind of frown upon it. So he's under no illusions that, you know, he's upset some people and he's, he might look like a turncoat and, and all this, but, you know, I feel like he's doing it for the best reasons. Just one last one on the uh, COVID, John. Is the biggest challenge, obviously, uh, footy in a hub, salary cap, list sizes, that affects you a big way. So that's a bit of a challenge right at the moment. Yeah, it's, it is because it's the unknown at the moment. So I was just on a, a call just before with, with a, a, a football club and we still don't know yet. Clubs are making decisions on players' futures. Um, they don't know what the, the TPP will be. Um, they don't know what list sizes will be. And it doesn't seem like the AFL are in any great rush to give them any assurance, which is frustrating for us. It's frustrating for everybody because we have to work on mechanisms that we don't know. We're, we're dealing with things that are out of our control. And that's never good in, in a negotiating sense. But I think for us, it's a little bit of a reset for the AFL. I feel like, you know, maybe it was a, a little bit overanalyzed and a little bit over scrutinized and a little bit over coached in a way. So hopefully the purity of football comes back. But one thing I wouldn't want to do is, is a young player to be disheartened and not feel there's a pathway for them to get to the AFL like you know, like there was for me and like there was for like there is for, for many different kids. I, I feel like the, the Victorian kids this year um, have really struggled not being able to play football. So, you know, if, if the AFL are taking money out of certain parts, you know, the talent pathway is something that I'd, I'd encourage them to continue to have as much money in that as possible because having faith and, and having, you know, a dream for young players is critically important for, you know, for them to be able to chase that dream. There's a lot of Josh Corbett's out there, uh, John, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, John, I you, actually... You claim him as, uh, as as your making. He was nothing until he came back to Murphy. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was, uh, he had a lot of ability, but anyway, well, that's another step that you've got him, which is good. John Meeson, <laughs> Mark Stone, yeah. he, he takes all the credits for Michael Barlow because Stoney recruited him from Shepparton. Anytime yeah. you hear about Michael Barlow's success, 
Yes, you've got to think of Mark Stone, all right? <laughs> well, well, he was another one of our players as well. So the, the Werribee Football Factory has been good to us. I, I think Stoney claims um, Ben Hudson and, you know, Podsy Adley and everyone. No, nah, not, not, not those two boys, no. Yeah. I, I don't claim they're, they're before my time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, John, I, I was just no, looking certainly at... Riccardi. A... Certainly, yeah. certainly Riccardi. John, I was just looking Sorry. at a picture of you in Adelaide Crows colours back in the day and you got the Camry logo and you got the curly blonde hair. I don't know. But no, the reason I mentioned that is yeah. because <laughs> I, I want to go back to, to your AFL playing days, but not, not so much from a rucking point of view. I want to talk about the leadership. Where did the leadership come? Because when you're at Adelaide, you actually played at Norwood as well in the Sandfall. You know, you were obviously taken at pick eight in the 2004 AFL draft, but we've mentioned that. But I mean, you had some injury issues as well, but we're going to go into Mottawari after these questions or post this question or two. But where did that leadership come with John Meeson? Because, you know, I have to admit, you know, I've been around local footy and interviewing coaches for many years. And that something struck me when I when I met you, I got a lot out of it. And I don't know if it's from the AFL playing experience, but did you learn a lot as a Norwood player, not just playing in the AFL, about leadership? Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a good question. I don't think it's it's really something that I can pinpoint as a certain part of my career. I had great influences around me. You know, I didn't have an easy path to the AFL by any means, but um, but having to to move to Adelaide, a city that I've never been to before, you know, and you're forced to grow up very very quickly. So for me, I basically had no other option and but to you know get your shit in the gears. Sorry to uh, sorry to swear, yeah, right. but um, Neil, Neil Craig was was very very big on performance and. And he was very, very big on standards. And he, and he, he had a saying, you either behave yourself into the system or out of it. So essentially for him, it was, yeah, shape up or ship out. And I learned from from a very early age, straight away, that, you know, I had Andrew McLeod and Mark Rusciuto and Simon Goodwin and Tyson Edwards and Brett Burton and all these fantastic players that I would watch on TV. All of a sudden, I'm kicking a, a football with them. But, you know, it's, and I would, you would just see what, how they prepare and, and go about it. And I was so far back from those guys guys because I was you know just a kid from what I worry out of long I had to put on weight I had to get better with my skills my game knowledge and basically just everything and Adelaide being a, a small town and you know it's a bit of a bubble as, as such you know you pretty much can't be a normal 18 year old because people know who you are it doesn't matter if you know you hadn't played a game at that stage people know knew who you are and, and that um, opened my eyes up a little bit and yeah it is, you are forced to grow up and and having been billeted out to the North Football Club so there was no Adelaide pros reserves at that time it was great because they were still very much professional, but they weren't at the level of the Crows. And I found uh, myself really enjoying myself at Norwood. And, and I played and made some great relationships there as well. Like Scott Borlase is an assistant coach at, at Brisbane. James Gallagher, who I played with at Norwood, is the list manager now at the St Kilda Football Club. And there's there's a bunch of other guys that I came through and played with there that are involved in various levels of football still. So I was pretty lucky to have that network at my disposal as well. One of the most rewarding things for you, John, was coming back to Model Warri a flag with Finchie and coach your, coach your junior club. That 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 must have been pretty rewarding to the time in your life and obviously you're in yeah. the city so you can't play down there but it must be it must have been pretty rewarding for you. Yeah, it was oh, it was unbelievable. That's the highlight of, of my football career in a sense. You know, I was lucky enough to play football all around the country. I've played in, in Darwin on the Tiwi Islands and South Australia and playing a, in a flag um, and coaching it with, with Josh was unbelievable. I, I had three years at Bowen prior to, to that flag and, and I learned a fair bit about that. I won two flags at Bowen um, in a very close, you know, Dan Donati was the coach at, at Bowen at the time and um, we ended up winning four flags in, in five years, but I was there for two of those flags. He was just unbelievable empathy and and, and respect from his players. And um, he was very, very different to any of the other coaches that I'd had. He was, you know, all about the players, always backed his players in. And I, I learned just as much from him as what I did from Neil Craig or, or Dean Bailey at, at Melbourne Football Club. So um, being able to see the standards and, and winning two flags in a row at Bowen and then going back to Modern Warrior, I, I felt like... Like it, yeah, it gave me a bit of a taste of, you know, I knew what to expect. I knew how to prepare. I knew how to, you know, speak to different players because I'd have players that loved being pushed and, and it's all about performance. And then other players, you can't do that. You've got to give them a coddle or you've got to find other factors that motivate them. You know, that was probably why it was it was good with with Josh. He was very structured and, and knew what he wanted to do. And I was a little bit more about the feeling and and imploring players and and trying to, you know, find ways to beat the opposition in, in that regard. So, um, yeah, it was, I look back now, now and and you know it's it was um, unbelievable. We felt like we had a we had a good shot. Josh had done a really good job over the previous couple of years, getting to a grand final and losing and, and building and retaining a list. And you know, I was able to come in and, and just add to what he'd, he'd done. And you know and everything kind of clicked at the right time. And 
and on the day we were, were really good. But um, you know, Bowen Heads take nothing away from them. They, they were fantastic that year as well. And, and I think that's them losing that as well spurred them on to, to you know, be really dominant last year as well. We Not only we can mention here that uh, we have had a bit of a Les Ash uh, medal theme, not only with Dom Gleeson on from Torquay, but previous episodes got a bit of a connection with Mitch Herbison and he was on. And last week uh, at our sponsored podcast, the Leopold Sportsman's Club, we had Richard Hockley on, who's the son-in-law of Les Ash. But what did it mean to win the Les Ash medal? And also, did you feel in an ideal world, and I understand player agent and family and all that, you know, had to change your sort of decision to what's going to happen possibly next year and playing wise. But in an ideal world, did you want to finish your career at Mottawari, playing career? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, 100%. And I'm doubtful whether I'll, I'll play next year. My body's feeling pretty good, but I'll be 35 next year. You've got to call it at some point. I've, I've had knees and ankles and last year I uh, got caught short by having finger surgery. I missed the last four games of, of the year you're referring to. But I mean, yeah, winning the Les, Les Ash medal is something I'll look back on and, you know, and be proud of, but it's not why I played football. And, you know, the Premiership medal win uh, means a lot, lot more to me than, than an individual accolade. I was, I was pretty shocked, to be honest. And But to share it with Dom Gleeson, Dom's a, a real class act. He's phenomenal. And, you know, if, um, Finchie's won four of the Les Ash medals. So if it's uh, my little measly one doesn't um, doesn't compare to his. But, um, but no, it is something that, you know, you probably look back on in time and be proud of, but it's not something that I, I hold at the top of my footy CV at the moment. And Collegians, close by, close club, very professional club. And I was a bit of a no-brainer to uh, end up being there in some capacity. So uh, you look forward to that, even though you might not play. And just a quick one there, Mark Stone. Uh, Jared Rivers is the coach of Collegians and you played uh, on with the list with uh, Jared Rivers at Melbourne. So you're pretty close in touch with Jared about yeah, that. Jared Rivers got the job with Collegians and we're, um, we're in contact pretty on. And, and for me, it was something that ticked a lot of boxes for me. Like it's it's five minutes from home. It's it's five minutes from my office as well, rather than, you know, the hour, hour and a bit drive down to Motorway. Um, a couple of times a week so my wife is pretty happy with that we've got a young nine month old boy Parker who you know I want to spend more time with and I want to I want to be able to see those little things going on I would have loved to have, have him see me play football for modern run out there the club got him like a little jumper for this year that unfortunately this you know the season got called off that would have been pretty special to um to see him wearing that because my dad was a, a premiership captain of the Motorway footy club my uncles were as well and you know I've got a long history there it's it's a phenomenal club. The Collegians is just a, a new challenge for me. It's it's something that ticks a lot of boxes. Like I said, it's close to home, but it's um, in the VAFA, which I rate as an unbelievable competition. It'd be, you know, some of the best VAFA teams would take it right up to, to some of the best VFL teams, I feel, you know, especially since Kevin's half their list is, is AFL and, and Heath Jamison, a, a premiership coach at um, Queenscliff and Joey's coached Uni Blacks, uh, Uni Blues, I think last year to a premiership in the, in the VAFA and the Premier League. So it's going to be a new challenge. Jared's great. He was um, assistant coach at Collingwood and, and coached Collingwood VFL the last couple of years, was at North Melbourne this year, unfortunately, got moved on with the uh, restructures and everything. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm keen to um, saddle up um, next to him and, and learn a bit from him, but also be able to give a little bit of a perspective as well, having coached at a, at a local level. You know, if I run out there and, and play, then um, somebody probably needs to um, tell me not to because <laughs> I don't know if I, I should be, but I'll do a few training sessions and, and see there how we go. go. But, um, yeah. but yeah, I'm looking forward to the challenge. Hey, uh, we always like to have a bit of banter on the show. And obviously when it comes to not so much just modern worry, but, you know, I've, I've been to many of those BFL halftime entertainment. One of the highlights of uh, covering local footy and all that sort of stuff. And I love how Mick Fitzgerald rocks up in his Blundstone boots and his <laughs> Potawari hat and he's, uh, I don't know, he's got that country feel to it, you know, as opposed to some of the, you know, suburbia towns that are in the uh, BFL. But I understand because I was watching that interview that uh, you're very keen on your running and you've got the, you know, the watch out. And obviously, uh, Mr. Dan Andrews, unfortunately for the Melbourne residents out there, you, you know, at one stage, you could only go with a certain amount of uh, exercise. What what was your sort of uh, marathon feats in terms of how much how many kilometres did you run and um what are some of those Motawari end of season celebrations like Yeah yeah no, I um when the footy season um, was postponed or, or cancelled I thought oh well I need to do something otherwise I'll do nothing over the lockdown and we obviously didn't know how long it'd go for so I decided to follow a marathon running plan a sixteen week plan and yeah it was it was tough through winter getting up on 
Saturday mornings when I'd do my long run, you know, it'd be it'd be raining coming in sideways and windy, but it, you know, I got through it and I yeah did the did the marathon two weekends ago and and it was the hardest thing I've I've ever had to do and I don't think I'd ever do one again. But it's one of those bucket list things you you tick it off and you move on and you never ever look at it again. That was basically just to keep my sanity. And then oh, the Modern Warrior celebrations were phenomenal. We LA grade won the premiership as well. They went back to back and our reserves lost by one point. If that had a, if they had a one, I reckon the party still would have been going. But but, um, you know, the, it was just unbelievable getting back to the footy club and walking in with the Premiership Cup and seeing, you know, so many people there that when I was a little kid, they were all back at the club celebrating with us and seeing, you know, um, Paul Grossman and and Dunkley and, and Fitzy and you know, all the people that have volunteered all their time for years and years and years and years and years and, years and go above and beyond. So, you know, the, us guys can go out there and play. was It was pretty special and, and that was a, a, a absolute um, highlight. I, I lost my voice pretty early on in that <laughs> night. So, I think I was yeah a bit but um but yeah I, I still remember um all that and i've got some videos on my phone that um that i'll we'll have to look back and get a bit of a smirk but um yeah it was it was a pretty special night that night and it would have been extra special if the reserves had won but they went and, and won the flag last year you know as underdogs against Torquay. so they've um i think it's a sign of a, a pretty good culture and a, a pretty good football netball club that there's just so it's so inviting and you know everyone's welcome and we all celebrate and you know the good times and the bad times together. Uh, John, um, it's been a pleasure to have you on the Stonehenge View. Yeah, it's uh, been a nice little trip down memory lane. Well, you can get in contact with the Stonehenge View. Uh, obviously, type into Facebook Stonehenge View. We're on Instagram as well. Our podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and our launching platform, uh, Podbean. And we're also on the YouTube channel, and we've got a Twitter account called at Stonehenge View. We'll see you soon for episode 29, and bye for now. <laughs>